please take them and turn with me to uh, the 13th chapter of the book of Acts. I'm going to do a little housekeeping here for just a moment. Acts chapter 13, and uh, we're going to begin in about verse 26. We're going to be talking about the redemptive plan of God. That's a big word, isn't it? Uh, you saw that word redemption in some of the songs uh, that we're singing uh, today. And uh, redemption is simply God uh, buying his people from the slave market of sin. And he uh, desires to redeem all men and give them freedom uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Freedom from death, freedom from sin, and uh, freedom to live for him. There are those who teach uh, that God's plan of redemption has changed throughout the centuries. Uh, they get confused because in our Bible we have both the New Testament and the Old Testament. And that confuses a lot of folks. And they think that there uh, are two different gods in the Bible. They think there's the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Of course, we know that's not the case. Uh, we know that God is the great God of heaven and He, tra he transcends time and he is recorded both in the Old and the New Testament. And we have foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ who came and took on human flesh. We have that foreshadowing in uh, the Old Testament through the messianic promises and prophecies and so forth. And uh, so throughout history, uh, men have thought that in the Old Testament that you came to salvation in one way, redemption, in one way, and in the New Testament, uh, there is a new way of redemption or salvation. So they believe that after Jesus Christ, uh, the Lord himself changed his plan somehow. And uh, so uh, that's why some folks practically, uh, when they uh, teach in their churches that there is a greater importance to the New Testament than there is to the Old Testament, really don't understand this concept that the Word of God is one complete Word of God and it is a progressive revelation of His redemptive plan uh, through the ages. And um, this um, little frame here um, really depicts uh, the plan of God through the ages. God made promises to the folks in the Old Testament. He made promises to them. He made promises as far back as to Adam and Eve and uh, all the way up through Abram, all the way through Moses, and all the way through the Old Testament, through David, and all the way up until we come to the time of Jesus Christ. He made promises also to New Testament saints. And so what, what happens in relationship to redemption is that the folks in the Old Testament, they look forward to the promise being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And you see we have the sacrificial system and all those things there. All of those things were to point to the Savior. And so as you're reading, uh, for say, in the book of Leviticus, all of those sacrifices prefigure the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when you come to the New Testament, when you trust Christ as your Savior, you're looking back to His finished promise on the cross. And so the spotlight of all eternity, the spotlight that's most important in our lives throughout all eternity is the spotlight on the promises fulfilled in Jesus Christ on the cross and when He rose from the dead. And so that is... That is what the redemptive plan looks like throughout all the Bible. It's consistent throughout the entire Bible. There are those who have written about God's eternal plan. Uh, two very famous scholars. One is uh, uh, W.A. Criswell. W.A. Criswell was the pastor of First Baptist Church Dallas for 50 some odd years. 
Uh, he may have made it 60 years, I don't know. Uh, but he was there a long time. And back in the 20s, 1920s, 1930s, uh, he had a sermon that became famous. Uh, and that sermon, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> was the, uh, the, the scarlet thread through the Bible. And that's, that's what he taught was this plan of God's uh, redemption throughout all of history. And he began the scarlet thread after, after sin entered the world. And God made a promise in chapter 3, verse 15, uh, concerning the seed and that the seed would have victory uh, over the serpent. And that was the beginning of the scarlet thread. And you see the scarlet thread, uh, which is uh, the redemptive plan of God throughout all of history. And it goes through various uh, different uh, people. It, uh, it, it, it uh, is reminded in various, uh, and re repeated in various folks throughout all of history. The other, uh, the scarlet thread of redemption, uh, is another book that was written, and this book was written by a fellow in 1926, and his name was Buchanan. And uh, Mr. Buchanan, I uh, don't know a lot about him other than uh, this writing of this book, and he took the scarlet thread uh, from the story of Rahab in, in the book of uh, Judges. And he, be, he reminds us of the scarlet thread thread that was placed outside of her window and uh, she was she was saved from the destruction of the city of Jericho and so the scarlet thread in his uh, writings began at that time and came and go all the way through the end of the Bible uh, through uh, the Lord Jesus Christ now salvation uh, has always been and redemption has always been focused on the promise of God. In Acts chapter th uh, 13, we have an outline that the Apostle Paul uh, gave in the city of Antioch um, to the folks there in relationship uh, to uh, God's uh, plan of the ages or His promised plan of redemption. And so he begins in that chapter, and we're going to read the chapter in just a moment. I'm going to give you the outline here. And the outline begins in verse, uh, verse uh, 16, but I'm going to read another passage just briefly in a moment before I do that. But he talks about beginning in verse 16 of the 13th chapter, God's eternal promise of blessing. God made an eternal promise of a blessing, and that blessing of promise came in the Old Testament at the beginning, if you will, of the scarlet thread uh, throughout the Scripture. And that began in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, and I don't have Genesis 12 up there, but I'll read part of it to you. That original blessing came to Abram, and the, and the blessing of the Messiah would eventually come through the loins of Abram and through the promises that God made to Abram. You remember the promise that God made uh, to Abram was an eternal promise of eternal blessings in the covenant that he made with him. And the promise in Genesis chapter 12 uh, included both Israel, the actual people who were the physical genealogy or the people who followed uh, Abram, and then there were the spiritual folks who would come after Abram, the blessings that would come upon both the children of Israel and those who would become spiritual children of Abraham like we are uh, today. And so God made this promise that He would bless uh, all of the peoples of the earth through this one uh, that would come. And so God made this promise. Look at verse 16 of Acts uh, 13. This begins the message that uh, Paul gave uh, to these folks. He said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. 
the God of this people, Israel. He chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. That's quite a statement. Uh, Most folks wouldn't think of greatness as being found in Egypt. Egypt was a place where they became slaves, remember? But they became a great people in that land. And with an uplifted arm, He led them out from it. For a period of about 40 years, He put up with them in the wilderness. Verse 19. When He had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, He distributed their land as an inheritance all of which took about 450 years. Verse 20, After these things he gave them judges until Samuel, the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. So here God was blessing this nation. He was blessing this nation, and the blessings began even when they were slaves in Egypt. Can you imagine that? When we look at slavery, we certainly don't think of blessings, do we? But yet God was blessing uh, those people and making them a great people uh, when they were in slavery there. And so God's eternal blessings would come down through the people of Israel all the way down until the babe in the manger And then God continues in this text in chapter 13, verse 22. God's specific promise to David. God had a special, specific promise to David. I'm going to read to you in verse 22. And after he had removed Saul as king, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Now the original promise to David was in the seventh chapter of Second Samuel. In Samuel's second chapter, uh, Samuel, the second book of Samuel, chapter seven, verse twelve, he says this. He says this to David when your days are finished, when you die, right? When your days are finished and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up a descendant after you who will come from you and I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And according to Paul, in this text that was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you see that scarlet thread. You see God having His blessings upon the house of Israel, upon the people who were the people of Abram. And through the years that blessing continued and the promise was still alive and well. The promise of redemption through the Messiah. What a promise. You see, God's plan has never changed. Never changed. It was always focused on the spotlight and the main important point or person in all of the history of mankind, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in this text, uh, he tells us in Acts chapter 13 that this was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is going to be the one who is on that throne for eternity according to the promise. And then he tells us in this text, as we were pointing out already, according to Paul, this one, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the fulfillment of that promise. Look with me at verse 23. In verse 23, he says this, From the descendants of this man, speaking of David, from the descendants of this man, David, according to the promise, the promise that he made way back yonder, all the way back yonder, possibly to Adam, and then to Abram, and then to David, 
from the descendants of this man according to the promise. And I, I make the word promise, not promises. It is a singular promise. Of course, it has many facets to it. We're going to talk about freedom we have in, in, in our Lord this morning, in the Lord's table. And you're going to see all the facets of the freedom that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has brought to Israel, verse 23, a Savior, Jesus. And you remember his, his name Jesus means the one who saves. And in the Old Testament, if you look at the book of Isaiah and other books in the Old Testament, when he talks about salvation, he uses the word Yasha. You all know that. And that Yasha is a precursor to the name of the Lord Jesus, Yeshua. Amen? And so the Yasha, the salvation of the Old Testament, is fleshed out in the Yeshua of the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God, in His plan that's been going all the way back, that scarlet thread, it hasn't changed. The scarlet thread is not broken. Amen? You can see it through all the pages of Scripture. And so when you get to Jesus Christ, that's where the scarlet thread becomes rooted in Him because that's who it's focused on. Verse 24, And after John had proclaimed, this is John the Baptist, before the coming of Jesus, a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Remember we talked about this baptism of repentance last week. A baptism of repentance was simply the people of Israel being told that the righteousness that they had in the law was insufficient because there was a king coming, a savior coming, who was bringing righteousness. So repent from that self-righteousness and turn to the righteous one, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all that was talking about when he was talking about this repentance that was preached by John the Baptist. Verse 25, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose or who do you suppose that I am? I am not He. I am not the Messiah. But before one is coming after me, uh, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. And so the Lord Jesus was to be this seed of David who would become that eternal King that's talked about in 2 Samuel 7. He would be that seed. And there's other passages that talk about that in the Old Testament. You can look some of those up and you should. You should spend some time there. And so the Lord Jesus was the fulfillment of this prof, uh, promise from the Old Testament. Look uh, with me um, at... Uh, I don't have it up there, so I thought I did. Let me read to you beginning again in verse 26. Uh, this is part of that fulfillment of the promise. He says, brothers... This is Paul talking to the, to the Jewish folks. He says, brothers... Sons of Abram's family, those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. They have killed him. They placed him in a tomb, verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to many of those around Jerusalem the very ones who are now witnesses to the people. Now God's promise is fulfilled in His completed Word, in His Word. I want you to notice these words. Verse 27. I want you to notice that the words of this text tell us that they are fulfillments of the promise of redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what he says in verse 27. He says, For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, they recognize neither the Lord Jesus nor the declarations of the prophets which are read every Sabbath. And in these passages, they are now fulfilled 
that he was to be condemned by them. They read it every Sabbath. And they didn't realize that this one they were putting to death was a fulfillment of the Scriptures. Verse 33, And God has filled this promise to those of us who are the descendants by raising Jesus as is written in the second psalm. And I encourage you to read the rest of all this text because he also talks about this text in the second chapter of the book of Acts. And one of the major things that he talks about in this text is that his Holy One will not see decay and that he will be raised up. And of course, David himself saw decay. And he makes that point uh, throughout this Scripture. And then in verse, uh, for, I don't have it all here on my notes exactly right. He talks about the promise of no decay. Um, and it was written about the David being decaying and not the Lord Jesus being decay. And then in this text, he says, therefore, in another psalm, he talks about these things. And that's just an illustration. Very quickly, an illustration of all these promises being fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of them were fulfilled in Him. So as we look, as we look at the redemption, the history of redemption, we see this scarlet thread that goes all the way from the beginning of the Scriptures all the way to the book of Revelation. And the focal point of it all is the promise fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we live our life as Christians, some people say, well, I'm really focused on the future. Well, that's good. And we should be. But we need to focus on the Savior who was and is and will always be. He is the great I Am who, who... died for us and who now lives for us eternally. And He lives in us who have trusted Him as our Savior. God's plan of salvation has never changed. God's plan of redemption is the same. It will never, never, ever, ever change. We know that from many passages of Scripture. We know that specifically in the life of Abram where the Scripture tells us that He was saved by faith. You know, you and I, we need to understand that. Is that throughout all of history, there's only one way to approach the God of heaven. It's through grace by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. And you and I, as we come this morning to the table, we have been freed from the power of sin if we've trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. We have been freed from the power of death. Yes, we'll die physically, but spiritually, As the Lord Jesus said to the sisters, He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me shall never, ever die. Our eternal hope is focused on Him. So we've been freed from sin. We've been freed from death. We've been freed to serve Him and to live our life for Him. This has been His plan forever. And if we miss this, we miss the entire purpose for which we were created. God created you and me so that He could save us and give us eternal life. The scarlet thread of redemption. Father, we love You. We thank You that we can come into Your presence. And we pray now as we come into Your presence further,
and as we focus and remember the table, which reminds us of the death and the resurrection of our Savior to give us salvation. So we come desiring to live our life for you as clean vessels in our Savior's name.